Welcome to the History Unplugged podcast, the unscripted show that celebrates unsung heroes, myth busts historical lies, and rediscovers the forgotten stories that changed our world. I'm your host, Scott Rank. The Titanic was a luxury vessel and the largest movable man-made object of its time. It sank on April 15, 1912, off the coast of Newfoundland in the North Atlantic. Over 1,500 of the 2,240 passengers and crew lost their lives in the disaster. The Titanic is considered a cautionary tale of the arrogance of builders that their creation could be completely imperious to harm. It was also a perfect storm of events that happened at once. You had some of the wealthiest and most powerful people on board at the time, like John Jacob Astor, the hotel magnate. The founder of Macy's was there. You had some of the most prominent fashion designers on board, aristocratic families. And as it's been depicted in films, a lot of class conflict came about with the first, second, and third class passengers. But beyond just a story of disaster, I think that the Titanic story still draws an emotional response from people a century after its sinking because it shows some of the best and worst of humanity. You have people acting bravely and with perfect calmness. They're laying their lives down so that others can live, knowing they're only a few minutes away from death. Then you have others who act cowardly and are willing to shoot others so they can get their place on the lifeboat. I mention this all because this is a preamble for a series I'm going to do on the Titanic with a co-host, Veronica Hinke. Veronica is the author of a forthcoming book called The Last Night on the Titanic, Unsinkable Drinking, Dining, and Style. In Veronica's book, she chronicled dozens of stories of those who were on the Titanic, and she also tried to painstakingly recreate menus and recipes, meals, cocktails, and drinks that would have been on the ship to really get a sense of what the lived experience was like there. What we're going to be doing in this series is spending each episode focusing on a person or a group of people and seeing what their lives were like before they got to the Titanic, whether they survived or not, and what their experience was like when the ship was going down. We'll look at bakers, artists and writers, popcorn vendors, cooks, helpers, those who rescued others who were going down with the ship and laid down their own lives, like Molly Brown, trendsetters, fashionistas, hoteliers, The musicians, those who played as the ship was going down. Doctors, and also swindlers, those who were preying on wealthy widows, hoping that they could get a place in their will. So we're going to be looking at all these different people, and something that Veronica did was pair a recipe of food or drink with each class of people, and something that actually would have been served on the Titanic, in order to approach history from a culinary perspective. And this is an idea that really isn't that far out there. I had a guest on the show about a year ago, Ken Albala, who studied cuisine and history in Roman, medieval, and Renaissance times, and has made and consumed food at that time period, and how it gave him perspective on what it would be like to be a medieval peasant when you were eating bread with coarse grain. Well, Veronica says the same thing. She says when she ate the tripe soup that a third-class passenger would eat, or when she had the desserts that a Edwardian lady would consume in first class, she describes it as helping her transport her back to the Titanic and at least get a small sense of what it would be like to be there. So in the show notes for this episode, we'll have the full recipe that we mentioned in the recipe spotlight. So if you really want to dive in and recreate in your own small way what it was like to be on the Titanic, you can at least do that with some of the food and drink we mentioned. So I hope you enjoyed this series with Veronica Hinky. All right, Veronica, welcome to this series. Thank you, Scott. I'm really looking forward to talking with you about these incredible stories of these amazing survivors and the people who fought for their lives. And I'm so grateful for this opportunity to further their stories. They've just been incredibly inspiring to me, and I hope that they can inspire others. Yeah, we're going to get into a lot of different types of people who are there, people that wouldn't typically think of those who are on the Titanic, bakers, popcorn vendors, writers, trendsetters, millionaires, doctors, even a few swindlers, people who marry rich widows and the like, which you can kind of expect when there's a lot of rich people gathered together in one place, there'll be those there to exploit it. And before we get into the why of why you decided to research this project and what we're going to discuss, what do you think is your absolute favorite Titanic story from everything that you've researched? Wow. I don't know where to begin. I loved every single one of these stories. Each of these stories, Scott, just took me through a journey, an incredible journey, and a time for me personally. Hope you don't mind if I get a little personal here. Go for Uh, it. 
okay, I just want to share there was a real purpose to me in researching and writing this book. And when I did, I had just gotten started and went to work one day and someone called me and said that my mother had died suddenly at 74. She was in perfect health. It was completely unexpected. Six months later, I was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer. I have never experienced a year quite like the one that I just experienced. And at the same time, you know, with other things happening as well, of course, as we all have, you know, our personal trials and challenges uh, to leave work and go home and, and focus on the book and such a challenging topic, delving into these horrific nightmarish experiences these poor people had and to find a way to truly honor them in the written word. And, and now thanks to the podcast, to, to uh, telling people about it through uh, the internet. So to do that was such a challenge and I, I found it very challenging. And one day a friend said to me, you know, there, this is no mistake that this happened, that all of this is happening at once. Each person's story that you're delving into is rich with inspiration. And they, each one of those people that I studied helped me get through what I was going through and to still find the strength to sit down at the computer every night and to go to the library on the weekends and read through probates and go through all of the extensive research that I did, uh, each one of them were like, each one of those stories were like the wind beneath my wings. But if I had to pick one, one story, it's about someone who didn't travel on the Titanic at all, but he mailed a letter from the Titanic he was super excited to be there seeing off his wife's uncle and he sent a letter. It was the first letter to be sent from the Titanic, sent it home to his wife. And I think just the act of him doing that really daylights for us the um, social significance of this great ship at that time that he was just on board for a little while and he took the time to take Titanic stationery and pen a letter to his wife. And then in stepping off in Southampton before the ship sailed, he in fact survived the Titanic. He was a survivor himself and, uh, a horrible circumstance happened to him afterward. Uh, his, his uncle that he was seeing off, his wife's uncle, he did survive. And in the 1940s, this man, Paul Danby, who wrote the first letter from the Titanic, he was killed at, in, a, in a Nazi concentration camp. He died at Sobibor. And to me, that Holocaust connection to the Titanic is just sort of a a collision of sorts of two just magnificent, incredible pieces of our world history. And it's told amazingly in the story of Paul Danby. Yeah. And we'll get to him later. He really has an amazing story. And I wonder when you were looking at stories like this, what angle were you hoping to look at to have a fresh perspective on the Titanic, since this is something that's been studied laboriously by many people over the years? So the focus was how to extrapolate what originally was a 250-word magazine article in honor of the 100th anniversary in 2012. And it was the focus was on wines and cocktails and how to turn that into a book. So the the people that I decided to look at were the people who had ties to food. In the case of Paul Danby, for example, the man we just spoke about, his uncle was included in the book because he wrote a letter home to his wife detailing the divine lunch that he had had on that first day on board the Titanic. And he talked about the draft Munich lager that was on board uh, by the company Wrexham Lager, Wrexham Brewing Company. Um, and those were the people, for the most part, who we really put under a microscope and looked at 
um, the details of their life. Who were these people? Because there were so many incredible people. How do you define which ones to look at? So we looked at those who had ties to the food, people who had tucked away a menu and managed to uh, carry it with them onto the Carpathia, which rescued survivors of the Titanic in the wee hours of um, Sunday or Monday morning, April 15th. We looked at people who had um, jobs in any kind of food-related activities uh, and even off the ship, like Popcorn Dan, the gentleman from the area where I grew up, Merrill, Wisconsin, he operated a popcorn cart on Main Street at home, not on the on the um, Titanic, but at home he did. So we kind of found a way to, as I said earlier, to extrapolate and look closely at who were these people. Because so much of what we can tell about them tells us about what life was like back in the days of the Titanic in 1912. One aspect that I'm curious about in terms of historical perspective is that in this series we'll have recipe spotlights where you have a food or drink that you pair with a particular person or a group of people. How do you think researching the food and drink consumed in the Titanic gave you insight into what it was like on the ship? And I, I should mention with a little bit more what I mean by this question. I had a guest a long time ago on this podcast who looked at culinary history. He would see what ancient Romans or medieval people ate and would try to recreate bread recipes from the medieval period or drink spiced wine from the Roman period. It helped him to imagine what it would be like to live at that time. And sure. did you feel anything like that of eating or drinking what people would have actually consumed on the ship? Did that do anything for you in that sense? Absolutely. You know, there were so many telltale signs from the research that I went through. And I just mentioned one point a little bit earlier about the draft Munich lager and that Adolfo Selfeld had drank that at lunchtime or he could have. We don't know for sure if he did drink that. But the fact that Adolfo even wrote a letter detailing the whole menu to his wife tells me we're not the first foodies, right? We're not, this is not some new concept that people are um, in love with their foods and they um, look forward to their meals and they, um, you know, make a big deal of them. In fact, you know, the, the Edwardians actually might've celebrated food and dining even more so than we do, certainly much more elaborately, but I don't think that's something new to us. Um, We might have, you know, so many food television shows and, uh, you know, plenty more recipes to choose from these days. I'm sure we do. But um, it was just as important to the Edwardians as it was to us. Were there any recipes that really stuck out to you for any reason? Maybe it was something that sounds really strange because it's not something we do, but you were pleasantly surprised or stuck out for a different reason? Yes, there there definitely was. I'll get to that. But first, you know, I have to say there were so many just wonderful recipes that came out of this collaboration with the different chefs. We spoke with home cooks. You know, we have a, a woman from um, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, uh, Marjorie Beretta. And I remember speaking to Marjorie on the phone about a year ago on a, a cold winter Sunday. And she was so delighted to hear from me and, and tell me about her recipes for things like artichoke bottoms and salmon mousse, things that she had developed into recipes based on the last first class dinner on the Titanic. And she had a dinner party for her friends. And so those recipes, or a few of them, are in the book. And um, I was just delighted to meet people like Marjorie. Um, I loved the colorful spring pea souffle and spring pea soup uh, duo. He calls it the spring pea duo that Michael Lashowitz, the Chicago chef, uh, he's actually in Winnetka, a suburb of Chicago. Um, he contributed these lovely recipes that really showcase spring peas well. And uh, as you know, you know, April was, it was a springtime menu for the most part, or, or the menus were um, springtime. 
um, menus on the Titanic because of the time of year. So we see, you know, rhubarb and um, spring peas, plenty of them. But uh, I, the reason I love those so much is the bright green color. It's just, they're just spectacular. And 